Great, cool. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nicola, and thanks for coming to what I think is probably the um, best titled uh, session of the whole event, Wrestling for Ad Spend. Not come up by me, by you guys. Um, and on the panel today with me, I have David Kushner from Leaders at Sport. So, David, if you'd like to come up. And also Maya Herm as well from Rello. Thank you. Cool, great. So um, I'll give a little bit more context about the session in just a moment, but before I do that, I thought it'd be great to hand over to you both to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what you do. Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, yes, I am uh, the content director at Leaders in Sports. So we are an events, a content a business that really exists to serve and connect the international sports industry. So we're talking to the the senior figures, the decision makers in all sorts of sports, all sorts of parts of the, the ever-expanding sports industry all the time. Fabulous, thank Great. you. Um, and I'm Meyer Herm. I'm the director of customer success for Rello Metrics. We're a sponsorship analytics company, um, a software that measures the value or ROI of sponsorship on broadcast, social media, and streaming. Um, we work across number of brands, uh, agencies, rights holders, and we're seeing kind of a, a big growth in publishers, or I should say uh, media entities measuring their value. Great, thank you. So to give a little bit of context, we've had a great session just before, which has been talking us through the kind of the disruption in the sports rights market and, and you know, what's happening in, in that regard. So kind of big lead here is, you know, and the, and the link to the title is that Netflix have just recently paid over $5 billion um, for the WWE flagship show Raw. Now that is a phenomenal amount of money and that is going to start taking place um, from 2025. Um, so the big question that we're really looking at here and kind of grappling with, and it's been said before, but I feel like there's been a significant shift, um, you know, very recently. You know, is this the start of a new um, sports bidding rights wars? So, um, you know, to give a kind of um, addition to the Netflix deal that's happened, we also saw that Sky spent um, their biggest investment to date um, in over 30 years um, for, to show 1,200 different matches over the year. So we know and we saw earlier that sport, no matter what form it comes in, is always really pivotal to, to a lot of strategies. It really, we know it brings in audiences and people are deeply, deeply passionate about it. So it's not just the fact of watching it, it's that connection that it really has with the fans. And we know that through that, that is what kind of like stimulates a lot of this excitement. So, um, you know, we can see as well that a lot that we saw at the session this morning, um, a lot of the streamers are starting to move into ad tiers, and I think that's where um, Maya's going to be able to add some great perspective there. Um, because are they, you know, is this move to um, bringing in these new sports rights, is that going to, you know, stimulate advertising demand for those platforms? And when we really need to think about it, we need to think about the consumer and, you know, is this the right strategy for them? Um, you know, having, having the, um, the sports content and their, you know, their beloved teams all over different platforms, is it going to work for them? Um, so, as we kind of kick off, I think the, the main thing is, do you guys think that there's going to be a big kind of bidding rights war and we'll have all these different players in with their big pockets of cash? I think it's, it's happening. I mean, I think in the U.S. we work with a number of um, streaming or broadcast entities like Paramount, Discovery, uh, ESPN, etc. And I think the reason that they're seeing the value is obviously the hours during a day to watch broadcast is confined. So mm. wherever you are and whenever you want to watch sports, now it's basically readily available 24-7, 365. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's happening, and I, I'm sure David has more to add on that, but... So, yeah, because you're speaking to the rights holders yeah. you know, all the time, aren't you? I guess you're kind of hearing from them what yeah. impact it has on them and what they're going to be doing about it. Yes, and uh, it's been really handy for sports leagues to have Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, the, the major players around, yeah. even when they weren't even bidding. So for five, six, seven, eight years, because it's helped, you know, just the, the perception of competition has helped drive prices up to some of those premium uh, properties like the Premier League rights, mm. for example. There is a, there's a lot of uh, fragmentation, as, as Alex was saying earlier, there's, a, you know, a huge, almost limitless amount of choice. But the sports industry is driven by media rights revenues. It's what makes the whole thing move. Yeah. And so there's 
these are some of the biggest decisions, in fact, probably the biggest decisions that the major leagues will make about where to place their rights, where to seek investment, and how actually increasingly to split them up. So I think we used to talk about um, free versus paid and free versus paid versus streaming. In general, it tends to be a bit of everything because you want to be, you know, it's very useful in a number of ways, as Alex pointed out, in terms of the documentaries and all of, of that sort of thing, to be in business and have good relations with a Netflix, even yeah. if you're probably not, if you're at that very top level, going to really want your entire rights to be with a single service provider like Netflix. Mm. Yeah, I think also the like long tail effect of being on all three and what we see on the social media side is, and Alex spoke to it before as well, but the fact that social media continues to be a major anchor for the, again, post-event viewership. And I think that also from an advertising perspective means you're not just packaging the media rights for just the event, but the inventory then reaches social media and goes beyond and that that's probably also going to influence pricing and media rights and things like that more and more because it's, you know, it's not just watching Champions League last night, it's catching it on Instagram the next day, checking the highlight reels days after. And from a sponsor pers or sponsorship perspective, I would say, you know, you can be the title ad sponsor for the Champions League on linear broadcast, but you could also buy an LED board and that gets you visibility, not just in the match, but in everything else that comes after. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's to, to David's point, it's being integrated in all three, but I think the inventory and the pricing of it is gonna change dramatically. Yeah, because I imagine like for an advertiser to try and value everything up across all of those different places, it's very work hard. out what they wanna pay for it, yeah. it must be really challenging. Yeah, I mean, I, I was also listening to the Tesco um, example and they were talking about econometrics and all of these things in terms of like media mix and anticipating that and I think what we see is, um, you know, there's traditional media value that we use in sports sponsorship, but we're seeing demand for how many times was the brand mentioned during the broadcast on audio and what does the brand affinity look like? And so, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I'll always speak to the data side, but making decisions about media rights from a rights holder perspective and from a brand perspective means you should probably have some data to back that up around are you matching the audience you want to match? I, I think sponsorship is just going to get way more strategic versus where yeah. it's been in the past. And, and to complicate matters even further, if you look at Netflix versus Apple versus Prime Video, then YouTube, yes, they're all streamers, but they've all got very different reasons for doing what they're doing yeah. and are doing yeah. things in a slightly different way. So there's a lot of sports leaders who are really trying to figure that out. And if you're not directly in business with them, it can be quite difficult to try and decipher and to, to give us, what's going on. To kind of bring that yeah. alive a bit more, what, what do you mean? So, so bring, give us well, Netflix, for example, yeah. despite having paid billions to mm. broadcast WWE pretty much around the world, they claim they're absolutely not buying sports rights because right. they, you know, it's semantics, but they yeah. say that's sports entertainment. They're doing the Jake Paul, Mike Tyson. And they also did the big, didn't they do the golf um, and, yeah, yes, kind and of live swing, event type? Swing, and they've yeah. got this phrase sports adjacent. Right. So again, supporting what they're doing around documentaries, not necessarily yet buying Premier League rights, what we might describe as sort of traditional core sports rights. Amazon, there's obviously a huge retail angle there and a real market by market approach. Um, and Netflix is probably looking for global deals where it can. Again, in the sports world, that's really difficult because sport has traditionally been sold on a market-by-market -market basis, and then there's all sorts of different lengths of contracts, different market um, uh, specialities. Yeah. So there's a lot of sort of a lot of stuff going on here. Then you look at a YouTube. We heard from YouTube earlier. Yeah, they're spending on a package of NFL rights. They're not spending on much else, and yet you can sit on YouTube and click the live section on YouTube any weekend. You can get a pretty good diet of live sport that Sky Sports are putting on there, that uh, sports leagues are putting on uh, their own channels, and you can quite happily watch yeah. a lot of very high quality live sport. There's no traditional rights fee involved there. So again, it's all these new models and sports organizations trying to figure out how they don't get into a situation as they seek these new audiences where the revenues they've been used to and are absolutely critical to their survival in some cases aren't being affected. 
Yeah, and so I was just thinking then, because you've got, you know, also if they're bringing in the ad tiers, they're thinking about just kind of standard ads, but then you're working a lot with sponsorships, which, yeah. you know, I imagine for a brand is a really big, big investment yeah. that they're doing, and th that's the kind of challenges. So I, I imagine if that right's going to go to that platform and it's going to be doing all of that, am I going to get my value as a brand? Or? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think I'll probably make the argument that I think sponsorship is more and more a strategic uh, play rather than just a bad, quote, badging exercise, things like that. And I think it's become a really effective way to not just get brand affinity or visibility, but to activate with a very unique audience if you're just trying to target, you know, for example, we work with a brand that sponsors Women's Champions League. I think we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. And they wanted to just sponsor Women's Champions League because they just wanted to target a female football audience because they noticed that a major segment of their consumer was 55-year-old white men who were going to die in the next 25 years. And so they were like, well, we have to refresh our consumer base, right? And yeah. so their idea was sponsorship makes, made sense for them. It, you know, they're a European-based brand. And they knew it was gonna be on DAZN, so they knew that initially it was gonna be before pay, or outside free to air, and now that DAZN has the subscriber component, there's a bit of a change, but they still get all of that data and information of who's watching, and so I, I just think that type of decision from a very large multinational brand will probably continue. It happens already, but I think it will continue to be much more strategic about where does it go from the live content to they also activate on social in markets differently? And yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll always advocate for sponsorship, but I'm yeah. really biased. But I get, and I guess also, you know, if they're doing that sponsorship, what you're saying there, what I'm hearing is that they want to maximize that those impressions yeah. each way, all right. the way through that kind of right. fan journey and, right. and the intention. And if we look at like outcomes, yeah. like the outcome there is like they're hoping that, you know, a young female football fan or young fan is gonna say, well, I saw that brand and I know they're a white goods company and I'm gonna buy my next hair dryer from them versus not. So it, it's yeah. like, it was a major strategic change for them. And I think, yeah, a lot of, and David, probably you can speak to this too, but a lot of rights holders, I wish there were more sports people at this event, by the <laughs> way, because I'm like, the things we're talking about, like that we've heard is, is stuff that all sports rights holders need to be educated on because yeah. I think there's a big gap in that as well. But yeah, I think it's it's a it's a smart way to get your outcomes and control your outcomes while you're still getting brand visibility yeah. in terms of sponsorship for live sports. I think it's that it's that convergence of everything, isn't it? It's like everybody yeah. when you were saying about the sports rights holders, I was thinking, you know, for many, many years they've been able to just stay within their industry, know their sport, know their fan really well. Oh, it's blowing Whereas up. Whereas right that now. must be so different yeah. now for them. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, there is a risk attached because this is this is their primary source of revenue in a lot of cases. I think there's a really interesting, you talked about the social channels in terms of clips. We haven't talked about them in terms of potentially being live broadcasters as well. And there's a really interesting deal that is about to kick off where ITV has long been the live broadcaster for the British Touring Car Championship mm -hmm. Motorsport Series. This year, as well as um, broadcasting live on ITV4, they're going to broadcast that, the ITV coverage, globally on TikTok. Yeah. So, again, <laughs> yeah. more layers of... Um, it would be interesting to see what happens with the ads there, actually. Yeah. But, but another layer of complexity, another attempt to reach this new audience, and I think it's one that we're going to be thinking about and looking at in terms of trying to unpick exactly how the revenue... You know where the revenue is there in that, or is that simply about? So is that like an ad reach? revenue? They're, they're going to generate ad revenue off TikTok, or potentially? Yeah. I think it's. Yeah. I think we still need to figure it out. But again, mm. it's a it's an element of sort of testing and learning, I think, and uh, doing so in quite a public way. Yeah, yeah. I think there's also to that point, it, it triggered the thought of. I mean, Burnley football women tried. Yeah. To, they streamed games on TikTok. Whether or not it was an ad thing or a visibility thing, I think it's definitely happening to sport. But I, I said this to some people that work in ad tech earlier, so if there's anyone in the room that can make, course correct me, I feel like sports is the DS, is a DSP, like a, a demand side platform, right? That For working in sports, that's like a big term for me to, to <laughs> say out loud. But I, I think more and more it's, you know, to, to David's point, whether it's going on linear and streaming, plus they're gonna have virtual inventory. I mean, mm. who knows? Like that that is something we're seeing more and more of. So I think 
I, the inventory feels quite endless, and the revenue, I think, will be Yeah, well, really the money doesn't, watch. just because there's more impressions, there's not more money. Right. Um, so just as we're kind of wrapping up now, what would be, like, the three things that, you know, or top two things that should be taken away from this for um, brands, advertisers? I'm going to make you go first. <laughs> well, I will, I think something to watch out for is rights holders, so leagues, um, sports events, um, carving out new formats and we've seen this a little bit you know the classic example is t20 cricket short form cricket which yeah. is now actually 15 20 years old um but still referred to of a very um, old sport yes of a very old a recent sport. um but i think there's uh, there's an example happening at the moment in the nba which within their regular season they've created an in-season tournament sort of nicely packaged you know mid-season different thing yeah um that is absolutely, pr and, you know, they're never going to say it, but has been created uh, to attract Netflix, you know, a streamer. And also, like, an opportunity on. for new brands to perhaps yep. get into. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Maybe it's always been, you know, those bigger, bigger brands, whereas maybe right. this now gives, you know, other yeah. brands. So, so kind of saying to everyone, keep your eye out, because there might be packages that, are, you know, suit what your objectives are. Definitely. I think sports making pretty fundamental changes to formats to yeah. seek out and make something that is absolutely as attractive as possible to this new type of broadcaster yeah. is going to be a big trend. I think oh. mine would just be that inventory is going to change, like in the same way yeah. that David's talked about formats changing. I think in the US we see digitally enhanced dashboards in the NHL and all of these sort of new components that are overlays. I mean, that's, again, more on linear, but can happen on, on streaming. So I think we're going to see new types of content being sold and packaged, whether it's displays in streaming or on social media or again virtual advertising i think it's there's a lot of inventory and the rights holders are definitely going to be uh having to keep up with it cool yeah well thank you very much thanks great thank conversation you. thank you